Good evening and welcome to the Science in the News Spring Lecture Series. Welcome to our fourth lecture of the series tonight with graduate student Leonora and she's going to be discussing symbiosis in carnivorous pitcher plants. We will get started in just a few minutes, but while you're wa while you are watching the lecture, feel free to ask questions using the Google form below as well as submit feedback at the end of the lecture um, with any advice for future lectures or any technological difficulties. Uh, thank you for being with us and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> so, hello everyone. I'm Andrea. And I'm Jess. And we're the coordinators for this lecture series in the spring. Um, do I start that? Sure. Sorry. Um, so I'll start off by telling you a little bit about um, some of the activities that we do f with Science in the News. So in general, we're a group that's interested in uh, graduate students communicating science with the public. And so to that end, we have a bunch of different events. We have science. We have our Science by the Pint events, um, which we have a flyer for outside, in which we have a professor and grad students from the professor's group come and mingle with the public over a beer. And it's a great opportunity to just talk with them informally about their research. We also, and we have a number of scheduled events coming up once a month. And then we also have um, a lecture series, which 
you obviously know about. But uh, we have a fall series and a spring series. So we have one lecture left in the spring series this, this year, and then you can stay tuned for our fall series. And then we also have, if you notice, there's a stack of business cards outside. Feel free to take one. Uh, we just got them in, and they're, they're very, very exciting. They, they're for our Signal to Noise publication and our new Signal to Noise Waves publication. So Signal to Noise is a series of articles that we post on the web um, that are written by graduate students to provide some perspective on different scientific topics. And then Signal to Noise Waves is actually another publication related that we've started recently. Um, that's a short form article, so it's shorter and it's it's supposed to be higher. It's supposed to be covering the science in the news right as it's breaking, and so we we consult with other graduate students and and um, just generally experts to provide you sort of an expert view on science as it's happening. So please check those out, and now I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Uh, so as many of you know, um, our lecture series has question breaks and an information included. So if you could save your questions for then, that would help keep the lecture flowing. And um, if you haven't already, please grab a handout and a survey as you walk in. And for those of you tuning into the live stream, um, there's online forms you can fill out too. Um, the survey is especially important to us. It lets us know how we're doing, how we can improve, and feel free to leave ideas for uh, future seminars as well. Um, and with that, without further ado, Leonora, take it away. So give me a minute to figure out the mics. I may be wearing three tonight. I'm going to see, can everybody hear me in the back? Or should I wear a mic for this room also? It's OK? OK, well, you know, raise your hand and wave at me or something if you can't hear. So my name is Leonora, and I'm a fourth year graduate student. I study evolutionary biology here at Harvard. And I'm going to be talking to you tonight about carnivorous plants and also about some of my dissertation research that I've been working on for the past four years. The title is Investigating Symbiosis in Carnivorous Plants. And also afterwards, we have some live ones that are from my, my uh, studies that I've brought in. So you can look at them afterwards or during intermission. So our roadmap for the evening is that first we're going to be talking about the evolution of carnivorous plants. Then we'll talk about symbiosis in pitcher plants, which are a type of carnivorous plant. Then we'll talk about convergence in pitcher plant communities. And finally, a short bit on carnivorous plants and global change. And if you are not familiar with some of these terms, that's fine. We're going to go into them more when we get to those sections. Just also as a heads up, my research will be in the second and third parts of the talk. Um, parts of these sections will be some of my experiments that I've conducted. So the first question people might ask is, what is a carnivorous plant? And what do you, does anybody have something that they think of immediately when you think of a carnivorous plant? Venus flytrap. Venus flytrap, yes. <laughs> so that's commonly the first carnivorous plant someone would think of. And this is a snap trap. That's the type of trap that, they, that it is. And it has these fine hairs on the inside here. And these hairs can be triggered when an insect walks over them. So once they're triggered, an electrical reaction happens, which causes water to move from the inside of the trap to the outside of the trap, causing it to close. And I have a video here. You can see what this looks like if you've never seen it before. So there's a fly. Um, they're often attracted by nectar. You can see these are the hairs that's, that are triggered by the fly moving. And then they're trapped. Occasionally, if they're pretty big, they can get out. But it's actually pretty rare. A lot of times, they're trapped, and then they're slowly digested by digestive enzymes produced by the plant. Another type of trap is... Um, is something like the sundews. These are called flypaper traps because they're very sticky. They have these very sticky um, secretions that are also very sweet and sugary. They attract insects who then come feed on them 
and then are stuck. They're trapped like flypaper. And then the plant will slowly curl around them, and it'll digest them with digestive enzymes. This is a bladder wart. They have bladder traps, which are sort of suction traps. They're mostly underwater, and they, um, they're quite small, but this is the fastest moving carnivorous plant. And I'll show you a video here. So they have these traps. They also have trigger hairs, like the Venus flytrap. And when triggered, it um, very, very quickly suctions in prey. So you can see this video has been slowed down 72 times because it's too fast for the human eye to see. So this is, this is very, I'll do it one more time because it's so cool. <laughs> So wait for it to finish. Okay. <laughs> so it's probably one of the fastest plant movements in the whole plant kingdom. And then this is the last type of pitcher plant of carnivorous plant we'll be talking about tonight, and it's um, called pitcher plants. They're pitfall traps, which means that they're passive. They're just like these cups. And they open, they form at the end of leaves, and they slowly open. But once they're open, they don't move anymore. And that's mostly what I study and what I'll be talking about for most of the night. And you can see some sundews, some of these, and some of these up here. There's also a video of the opening of these plants. So this is time lapse, probably over a couple days. And slowly the plant will open. It's forming. It's growing bigger. It slowly opens. And then once it's open, it will collect rainwater. It has these very slippery sides and a pool of water with rainwater and digestive enzymes inside. And insects are attracted by nectar produced around the lip. And then they fall. They can't climb back out. And they're digested. So the definition of a carnivorous plant is something that traps prey, mostly ants for pitcher plants, but traps some sort of prey. It makes digestive enzymes, and it gets nutrients from its prey. And if it has all these three things, it would be considered a carnivorous plant. The, this N here I'll go into in a second. So plant nutrients. Um, plants get their energy and basic building blocks from sunlight and CO2 via a process called photosynthesis, which probably most people already know what that is. But they also still need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in order to grow. And you would recognize this if you've grown plants and you fertilize them. So fertilizers almost always have these three elements, which are essential for growth. Nitrogen is probably the most essential. And so I'm going to be using this as sort of the signal for nitrogen and for nutrients for the rest of the evening. So where do you find carnivorous pitcher plants? They're found all over the world on all the continents except Antarctica, in places that have poor soil, low nutrients, lots of water, and lots of sunlight. Often these are bogs. So even in Massachusetts, we have pitcher plants growing in our bogs. You can see them sometimes if you go out on boardwalks. Um, they grow in areas that have very poor soil because they're good at getting these nutrients from insects. They also need lots of water and lots of sunlight because they're not good at competing with other plants in areas where there is maybe not enough water or not enough sun. So producing, producing the trap is actually costly for these plants. And so they need to exist in places that have lots of water, lots of sunlight. And that's bogs and very sort of wet rainforests that don't have really dense canopies are sort of the perfect locations for these plants. I like to think of pitcher plants being to nutrients as cacti are to water. So pitcher plants are really good at getting nutrients in areas that don't have much. They're very nutrient poor. They're good at getting it and holding on to it from their insect prey. Just like cacti are really good at getting and holding on to water in deserts in areas that have very little water. Coming back to the Venus flytrap, when scientists first figured out that plants could be carnivorous, this was the first one that they found and that they, you know, had some ideas about. In 1769, John Ellis, he was a botanist and he was studying these plants. He um, spent 
a, a letter to Carl Linnaeus, who was a very famous scientist at the time. Linnaeus is the one who developed our binomial nomenclature, the way that we name species today. And he, Carl Linnaeus, named many, many, many of the species that we know. So John Ellis sent him this letter with a specimen, a dried specimen of a Venus flytrap, and this beautiful picture that he had drawn. And he said, look at this amazing plant that I found. This is so neat. It, it produces these traps at the end of its leaves that look like rat traps. And we think they're there to catch flies and that they eat flies. And Linnaeus said, no, <laughs> that's not possible. That goes against the order of nature as willed by God. Plants cannot eat and digest animals. No, it's not happening. I don't believe it. And actually, that was the state of things for almost 100 years until Charles Darwin started working on carnivorous plants. Um, he wrote a book, Insectivorous Plants, in 1875, and in this book he has a lot of experiments that he did with sundews, um, mostly with sundews, with some other, with Venus flytraps too, and he really did the experiments to break it down and to show that these plants were producing digestive enzymes. They could digest and absorb nutrients from prey. So at this point, it was pretty well recognized that yes, this is actually something that's happening. Now Darwin, as many of you probably know, was really influential in our understanding of evolution and natural selection. And he also came up with a concept that we now call convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is defined as the independent evolution of similar features in species from different lineages. And I'll break this down a bit. But basically it means that things start in different places, but then they converge on a similar feature from different starting points. The classic example of this are wings in bats, birds, and insects. So wings and the ability to fly actually evolved separately three separate times. And you can imagine the ancestor of a bat might have been some small mammal, some small rodent that um, perhaps climbed trees, perhaps it glided, and mutations that would cause its fingers to elongate and to web were actually beneficial for these, these small mammals until they finally developed wings and this ability to fly. So perhaps they were first gliders. Birds and insects developed through probably different routes, but they came to this final solution of having wings and being able to fly. Now carnivorian plants also follows this pattern. We'll have a question section at the end. In I don't, yeah, I haven't heard about it. I don't know anything about that. Okay, okay. I will be. Yes, bye. So carnivorian plants follows this same pattern of convergent evolution. It has evolved separately at least five times in plants, probably more like six or seven. And the pitcher plant form, which I'll be talking about a lot, this pitfall trap, has evolved three different times separately. To illustrate this, um, you can look at these different plants. So there's three different types of pitcher plants across the top. And then there's blueberries, cactus, and bean plants. And what do you think are the most closely related? So off the top of your head, what would you guess? that the cactus is most closely related to them? Well, in fact, first, initial, initially scientists just thought, look, these look similar. We think these are all related. We think they're all in the same family. But now that we know a lot more about evolution and about how things have evolved, these ones, well, this, this particular pitcher plant is more closely related to blueberries than it is to either of these other two. And this one from Southeast Asia is more closely related to cactus than it is to either of these two pitcher plants. And this one from Australia is more closely related to beans. So they're in very, very different lineages. And they've evolved this same feature totally separately. These three are here again. And they're all in different families. And you can see they share a lot. So they have this sort of lid shape around the top. They have this cup that holds water. They have a lip around the front. 
that often they produce sugary secretions that insects are attracted to, especially ants. And they all have these features. They all have very slippery insides. They have downward pointing hairs to sort of guide insects inside. They share so much. But this one is from the family Saraciniaceae, and it's found in North and South America. This is the Nepenthaceae in Southeast Asia, and this is the Cephalotaceae in Australia. And this family, there's actually only one species, a single species, and it's only found in a very small part of Western Australia. And I'm not going to be talking more about this one tonight, but I'll be focusing on these two. So the summary for this first section is that carnivorous plants get their nutrients from prey. They grow in wet, sunny, low-nutrient places, such as bogs. They were studied even before Darwin's time, and initially people didn't believe that they were actually carnivores. And plants have evolved carnivory at least five, maybe six or seven times. And pitcher plants, this shape has evolved separately three times. So are there any questions for this first section? And I'm going to repeat your questions so that the live stream can hear. All well, so the way that that's um, okay. So the question was, am I including three of the pitcher plants as those those five part of those five? Um, and the way that you look at this is you look at an evolutionary tree, and you see sort of um, how many times has carnivory popped up on the tree, and in one point a pitcher plant is actually quite similar. They're, they think that maybe a pitcher plant evolved from another type of maybe a sundew. So in that case, that would be one evolution of carnivory, but you know, two different things coming out of that. So the three pitcher plants do count as three of those many, but um, there's also other ones. And it just depends on when they've, yeah. If, they're, if you can tell that there's a lot of organisms in between, that have evolved that are unrelated and don't have any of these same features. So, yeah. I have a question about the um, pitcher plants. You said that they open and then they stay open for their entire life and never close again? Mm -hmm. They get so up with water. Yeah, so one plant can have many pitchers on it and they do die. So some of them last only a few weeks, some last a couple years, but over time they do sort of break down. Um, they get eaten by insects, they get holes in them, they get filled up, yeah. But the plants can live for a very long time. And they even, if there's a drought or something, they'll stop producing pitchers for a while, and then if it rains again, they'll produce them. The pitchers don't work very well when it's dry. So, yeah. Yeah, it's n okay, so the question was, the coloration is so similar in these three different uh, families, and they think that it might be, it might have something to do with attracting insects. It's not really known. So there have been some experiments, but they've been pretty inconclusive about, you know, what what that coloration is actually doing. Some people thought maybe it was like leading tracks, you know, up and into the mouth. Um, it could also be that there's other organisms associated with pitcher plants that recognize that. One really I won't be talking more about this, but one really interesting thing that came out recently, just last year, was that under UV, the pitcher plants glow, the lip glows blue under UV, and, um, and that insects can see UV. So that's also convergent that these different types of pitcher plants do that. Yeah. Is there uh, anything you know about, know about convergence of the human life towards the plants? So the question was, is there anything known about convergence of the gene level for the three pitcher plants described? Um, there probably is not a lot of convergence at the gene level. Uh, they do all produce digestive enzymes, but they're usually slightly different enzymes. Even though they might all produce things that can break down protein, they're not the exact same. Yeah. So maybe one more, and then we'll move on. Um, why, why doesn't the plant digest itself? <laughs> That's a good question. So the question is, why doesn't the plant digest itself with all those enzymes sitting inside it? Those enzymes actually act more on things that are dead. So they don't really actively digest things that are alive. It's more like decomposition. So um, 
you'll see later in the talk, there's actually organisms that can survive inside the pitcher plants, and they're just fine. It doesn't kill everything that gets inside. It's just the things that get inside and die, then it digests them. So, yeah. All right. Okay, one more, and then I'll move on. <laughs> There'll be more time for questions, too. How did you establish that uh, the pitcher was the first pitcher plant? What was the question? Sorry. How did you establish that the first pitcher plant was uh, it's yeah. So that's based on a on an evolutionary tree, and when you look at an evolutionary tree, you can break it up into sort of different orders of plants, right? So there's um, different levels, different families, and then orders. And if you look at the orders that these are in, they're all in three different orders. Those three I was showing you. So blueberries are in the same order as that one first one. Cacti are in the same order as that second one. Does that make sense? So they're in different orders, and if you're in an, if you're in the same order, you can be more closely related because that's how they define it. Yeah, everything that's in an order is more closely related than than they are to things outside of. It. Okay. So we're going to move on to the second section, which is talking about symbiosis in pitcher plants. When you think of evolution, you may think of it as this really sort of brutal process of competition. Survival of the fittest, organisms fighting, killing each other in order to get resources, in order to survive. But there are other ways that evolution can happen. And large evolutionary advances can happen when organisms cooperate with each other. When things that have different skills come together and sort of can make something new. And some examples of this are the fact that plants, which form the basis of all of our food on our planet, actually evolved from coming, two different organisms coming together. So the structures that are able to use sunlight for energy actually originally came from a bacterium and another sort of early other organism that engulfed it, and the two of them working together were able to produce the early ancestors of plants. Another example of this is that fungi associating with the roots of plants is actually what allowed the first plants to move onto land. So we didn't have any land plants before this, but this symbiosis, this association between this fungus and these plants allowed them to then break down certain nutrients found in these very early soils and access these nutrients to be able to grow. This is called symbiosis. And it's commonly thought of as positive interactions, but originally it meant prolonged close interactions. So sim is together and bios is life, living together for a long time. And now most scientists use the second meaning, living together or prolonged close interactions. And it can be positive, negative, or neutral. So you don't necessarily have to have a positive relationship for it to be called a symbiosis. And this is because symbioses can fluctuate. So in different conditions, it might be positive or it might be negative. It really depends on the resources that are available and the conditions of the environment. Some pitcher plants do have these very positive relationships with certain animals, and they're pretty strange. So this is one species. Um, does anyone have a, an idea of what it looks like? <laughs> Want to risk a guess? <laughs> if anyone thought toilet, <laughs> That's how this one acts. It acts as a toilet. So there are these tree shrews, and they're attracted to these plants. They eat these sort of nutritious secretions that the plant produces here, and that positions them perfectly so that they defecate into the pitcher plant. And there's a lot of nitrogen in these species. So this, these pitcher plants use this nitrogen, and that helps them grow. So it helps them be able to grow in super low nutrient areas because they have this association with these tree shrews. Here's a picture of a similar association with a, a species of rat. So this is also in Southeast Asia. And you can see the rat eating something here, and it's positioned in the perfect way for its droppings to fall into the pitcher plant. Pitcher plants can also associate with ants. This is a species, also in Southeast Asia, where ants live inside these hollow stems. You can see this little hole. That's where they get in and out. And they, they rear their brood inside these hollow stems. They're their nests. And in exchange, they protect these plants. So they stop sort of weevils that might um, feed on the pitcher plant and make a hole in it. And then it's you know not functional anymore. And they also 
can dive into the fluid and climb back out. They're one of the very few organisms, maybe the only organism that can do this, that can, you know, dive in, swim around in the water, and climb back out. And they help their host to catch prey, and they also defecate into the pitcher plant, so they add nitrogen as well. And there are studies that have shown that if, like a big beetle, that's too big for the pitcher to digest on its own, if that falls in, normally that would sort of putrefy, and the pitcher would have to die off. Um, but if these ants are there, they can dive in, pull it back out. Sometimes it takes like 12 hours for them to pull it out of the pitcher. And they break it up into littler pieces over the pitcher. They sort of feed on it, and it falls back in. So then the pitcher can digest it without it putrefying. So there's some really interesting relationships with other organisms. I study organisms that live inside of the pitcher itself. And it's a really good... Uh, system for biologists to study because they're sterile before they open. They have no organisms living inside of them. But once they open, a whole community begins to form inside of them. And this consists of a whole food web. So there are all these insects that can survive and also microbial organisms such as bacteria and fungal yeast that can live in these pitchers. And these communities often can only survive inside of pitcher plants. So a lot of these insects are only found in association with pitcher plants. You don't find them anywhere else in the world. And it's called a food web because the prey, which is mostly ants, is sort of at the bottom. And then the other organisms feed on it. And it's not really clear to what extent they're helping out the plant or harming it. So some people think they may be removing nutrients because they feed on prey and they're taking nutrients out with them. But others think that the insects might be acting as the teeth and sort of chewing things apart and allowing the plant to access more of these nutrients. We really don't know much about the bacteria and fungal yeasts living in pitcher plants. And there are quite a few other organisms that are microscopic and are really hard to study that we really don't know, especially in the Nepenthes, which are the Southeast Asian pitcher plants. This is a cutaway of a pitcher plant. And inside here, you can see these digestive glands. They will secrete some digestive enzymes and then absorb nutrients back into the plant. And you can also see here how there's this lip and the lid over here. And I think this is a really cool analog of the human gut. So, it is a plant, and it's very different, but it's, it's an interesting analog because they're sterile before they open, and once they open, they sort of acquire a community from their environment. And that's similar to the way that humans acquire a gut microbiome. And we think that the microbes inside of pitcher plants may actually be helping the plant to access nutrients in a similar way that humans have gut microbes, which you may have heard about if you went to the talk about a month ago, Science the News talk. Um, in a similar way, they might be acting to help their host get some nutrients. So what the study that I was initially looking at is we don't really know what's there. The first thing we have to do is a survey to figure out what organisms live in these Southeast Asian Nepenthes pitcher plants. So I did a study in Southeast Asia. This is Singapore, which is an island country. And it's down here in this part of the world. I collected three different species of pitcher plants that are all found at three different sites across Singapore. And here's me collecting. Um, this is what the habitat looks like. And these are some of the pitcher plants. I collected the fluid in sterile tubes. So I just took the fluid out of the plant. I measured volume and pH. I added a preservative that allows me to bring them back to the US, where then I can count the insect larvae that were in there and also extract DNA. I'm not going to talk a lot about DNA today, um, but I do want to say that it's a really important tool, and it's something that I use a lot in my work. So DNA sequencing is a great technology which allows us now to look at a whole community. In one drop of pitcher water, there are thousands of species of bacteria and millions of individuals. So they're incredibly tiny, and even if we look at them under a microscope, the way they look, their shape, that's not going to tell us a lot about who they are. But snippets of DNA allow us to find out what is there because we know 
the DNA of certain known organisms, we can use snippets of DNA to actually learn about evolutionary relationships and how these organisms are related to each other. And so there's this new technology, which has only been developed in about the last five years, which allows us to look at whole communities, not just the DNA of one organism, but actually to look at the DNA of thousands at once. So that's the type of sequencing that I've been using to find out who are in these pitcher plants. Just to give an overview of the organism, most are species that have not been described yet. So most of the things I find are unknown to science. Um, bacteria that we find are mostly ones that like acidic conditions. And this makes sense because pitcher plants tend to be quite acidic inside. Um, we find mostly yeast as the type of fungi that like to grow sort of in liquid conditions. That also makes sense. And then aquatic insects, so larvae that can live, they like to live in aquatic environments already, mostly mosquitoes, mites, and flies. And a lot of these mosquitoes are not ones that bite humans, and they're not ones that are really commonly known. They're not the common disease vectors. We also find other microscopic organisms, such as very tiny algae and insect parasites. And it's neat because this DNA actually allows you to see inside other organisms too. So you can see different levels than you would be able to see just under a microscope. The thing that I'm still thinking about and I hope to work on in my future research is symbiosis in pitcher plants and figuring out if the organisms inside are helping or harming the plants. To what extent are they helping them access certain nutrients? To what extent are they taking nutrients out? And one of the ways we can do this is also looking at genes and, and functions of things inside of these pitchers. So summary for this second section is that evolution happens through cooperation as well as competition. When organisms come together, often they can do things that they wouldn't be able to do alone. Symbiosis is prolonged close interactions that can be positive, negative, or neutral. And most of the organisms on the planet are involved in symbiosis. A food web or a community lives inside of these pitcher plants. There's lots of organisms that are eaten, but then there are others that thrive and are found only within these plants. And most of the organisms we've found are unknown, and we still don't really know what they're doing. So this is sort of future, future work. OK, now it's time for an admission, but before, do we have some questions? Yes? Are there flowers associated with the plants? Are there male and female plants? And if so, do both have? It's a good question. So the question was, are there flowers associated with the plants? Are there male and female flowers? And how does that relate to the pictures? Yes. <laughs> More or less. Yes. Well, um, yes, they definitely produce flowers. Um, they're quite beautiful. The ones for, let's see, I don't have any pictures of the flowers. These are all modified leaves, pitcher plants, and true pitcher plants are defined as being modified by a single leaf. Um, the Saracenia flowers are, they're quite showy. They have these long sort of petals that drape down that are yellow, pink, or red, depending on the species. And then the Nepenthes flowers form on these kind of long stalks where there are many, many different flowers that kind of form like a brush. And as far as I know, both of those types of flowers have both male and female parts, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I don't study their reproduction so much, so, <laughs> yeah, yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was that DNA sequencing could give you an overestimate of the symbiosis because there's probably many organisms inside that have symbioses with each other and are not necessarily in a symbiosis with the plant. Um, the answer is that it's, it's difficult and you have to look for patterns. So a lot of it is through patterns. You look at networks and you look at abundances. So when I, I, I've sampled so far from about maybe 100 different plants in different, or different pitchers in different parts of the world, about um, at least 80 so far in Southeast Asia, and I have more that, I've, that are coming. 
Um, yeah, so for the things that are macroscopic that you can see, you can pull those out, like the larvae. And these, some, of those, some of those insects have been studied actually for maybe even up to like 80 years or so, because early naturalists that could see them would pull them out and look at them. So I can look at them also and I can say, oh, look, this is the same type of larva that this person found and wrote about in a paper you know, in 1960. So with those ones, you can kind of see that that's prolonged over time, right? And then you also see the organisms that show up over and over and over in association with the species. So when I sample from many, many different species, you see that certain ones really seem to be associated with this plant. But I do think that there are other symbioses happening there. So it's nested, right? There's, there's symbioses inside of other ones. And I'm, I'm not so worried about which ones are actually in symbiosis with the plant. I'm more interested in these networks and thinking about these as communities and how do these communities, how are they integrated? Yeah. Yeah. I think it would depend a little bit on development of the plant. So when they're first opening, they produce a lot of this nectar because they're sterile. They have some rain, you know, some rain or water will come in, but it will all be sterile. It's sort of like what you're saying, but they start out as that emptiness. And then, um, and then organisms come. But the plant might actually go through phases as it ages. Each pitcher might go through an initial phase where it's attracting a certain type of insect. And then over time, it's no longer attracting that one, but it's attracting a different type. So time can be a factor. Um, I think that if you emptied it out sort of in like maybe a mid-stage and put water back in, that some organisms would come back, but probably not everything. Yeah. That would be a fun experiment. <laughs> All right, so there's snacks and intermission. If you're interested in seeing the plants, you can come, come down. I think it's five or ten minutes? Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> See, all of the pitcher plants are carnivorous, including the one with the tree. Uh, the tree, tree shrew. shrew. <laughs> as far as I know, they still catch insects as well, but they might be moving. You know, they may be moving away from carnivory because you know it might be an evolutionary move. Yeah, and I think that's happening. You know, they're evolving all the time. All the time. Yeah. Is the glands for digestive enzymes uh, different from the glands that are secreting the nectar that is attracting insects? I think they, they are different, yes. Okay. So they the nectar different. is produced in a different part of the pitcher. It's produced usually around the top area that's open to the air. And then the digestive glands are mainly underwater. So they're mainly like in that pool. Yeah. And uh, in continuation to my earlier question, uh, I mean, how are these phylogenetic trees con uh, constructed? Like, I mean, how do you know that? Uh, I mean, one species is closely related. Yeah. I mean, how do you construct that tree? Yeah. Well, um, what we can now do is use whole genomes. But before that, people would just take a snippet of DNA that they knew was, was um, they knew what section of DNA it was. And they know that all, or, you know, they would sample all organisms. They know that all of them have it, something that's pretty essential. Like they use often ribosomal DNA. So they know um, the what function uh, the DNA part of the DNA. So they is well, they know they know that everything has it, and then they would sequence that from from all these different organisms, and you can actually see that there are base pair changes. So different base pairs change over evolutionary time with mutations, but also just by random drift, right? And you can use those changes to infer relationships. So you can see things that are have closer, you know, with certain types of DNA. If they look really, if the DNA is really similar in the like ATCG, then you can tell that they're more closely related. They've only split off evolutionarily maybe like a million years instead of like 40 million years. So how do you choose the correct snippet? Like, I mean, it really, I yeah. mean you, do you know that this is the I mean, snippet corresponding yeah. to some function of the gene or something? Sometimes they use ones that have functions, and sometimes they purposefully use ones that have no function because they want to see just like random drift, right? They want to see this part of DNA 
we don't think it's super essential. So we want to know, like, if mutations just jump in, how does that work? And the best evolutionary trees use multiple different snippets of DNA in order to infer these relationships. Or genomes. If you have the whole genome, you have a lot of information there. So, but that yeah. doesn't seem trustworthy. Um, I don't well, know. Well, they have algorithms. It's a whole field of science. It's called systematics. Okay. You could look it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which one should I? Plan B, Mike, because oh. this one died. That one's oh. okay. Oh, this one is. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Only one mic now. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you said that yeah, you didn't study some viruses, uh, uh, but with the uh, genomic information that you get from you, but how is um, is how, how would you relate the function? Um, so this first part that I talked about was just um, it was just using one section of DNA that you can use to identify an organism. But I want to what I'm starting to do now is I'm doing metagenomes, which means that you just you just cut up the, all the DNA that's in that pool, like all those bacteria, all those fungi. Um, and then you can sequence that. So you can actually look at functional genes. You can use and, and we know what their function is because we relate it to organisms where we know what those genes are and they're conserved. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, some would be like, uh, a very specific function uh, among the Yeah, so yeah. So uh, identify those functions which are uh, yeah. giving... which are important. Uh, yeah. It's a good question. I would focus on... I would first focus on things like genes that change nitrogen from a form plants cannot use into a form plants can use, right? So that would be a signal of that's probably something would be beneficial for plant to have bacteria that are changing it in that way. There's also genes that change bacteria from a form plants can use into a form they can't use. And that would not be, right? You wouldn't want to have a whole lot of those bacteria there. So it's still sort of guesswork, but it's just the start of figuring out the function. And then there's other experiments you can do. So I want to do an experiment where you grow the plant in a sterile situation. And then you can add, you can have some plants where you add the bacteria and some where you don't. And then you feed them a labeled nitrogen. And you can see, do the bacteria help the plant absorb that nitrogen into its tissue? So that's a more like experimental way. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for the uh, initial part, uh, you, you would still have to, I mean, chop up the genome and find out the 16S uh, bacteria. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah, so, but uh, in the second part, also, you would have to, like, uh, chop up the whole genome uh, of, the, uh, of all the organisms and yeah. then identify the function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you use these special bits of, you use special bits of DNA that can just attach to these random, you fragment it into lots of pieces, and then these special bits can attach, but you know what the ends of them are, right? So then you can yeah, then you can use the sequencer to, to bind to those known bits, and then they sequence the unknown bit. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's like called PCM? next generation sequencing, okay. yeah, and it's yeah, yeah. like Illumina is the name of the machine. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a question? So I was wondering, you were, you were saying that there's a uh, picture funds in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And how common are they, and why don't you study those? I do. I study those. Um, they're relatively common in bogs, but it has like to be the right kind of bog. More, yeah. Not primary bogs. Um, what's that place called? Poag? Is that what it's called? It, over by the Blue Hills, there's okay. a bog where you can see them if you go out on the. It's by a golf course, but it's, a, it's its own little kind of wetlands, and they have a, a boardwalk that you can walk along. I do study the local ones a lot. The first two are the are the local species, Saracenia purpurea, yeah. and I'm I'm just not focusing on them as much for this survey because they're more well known. So people have looked at their bacteria before. They've looked at their insects. Okay. They've done more studies with them. In Southeast Asia, there's just not as much research happening, so there's more need for that initial like, what's there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So where, where do you keep these plants? I mean... I have growth chambers. They need to stay very humid. They I like was, a lot of water. I, I was thinking that they don't like it like, like yeah. out here very much. Yeah. And, they're, and one of the... And the sundew is like with... Are, is it with the plant also? It, that one actually grew opportunistically. So I think it's because where I, I got them from a nursery. And I think at that nursery they probably also had sundews. Yes. And some seeds probably got in to my my plants and then over wow. time they popped up and I was like, oh look, two oh. carnivorous plants for the price of one. <laughs> oh. oh, that's, oh, okay. So, yeah, 
<laughs> that was by chance, but I, I think it's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, you can get these from from growers. Yeah, so can I just like yeah, so these are sundews. Yeah. And they just grew opportunistically in this. I think it's because the, the the nursery where I got these from also was growing sundews, and the seed got in. And then it, after I got the plant, they started sprouting up. Really? I'm like, oh, extra. So like, I can buy these and have them in my home. Yeah, they like to stay really humid. So sometimes you want to like, sometimes especially these Southeast Asian ones, you keep them like under a glass. Or you keep them in an aquarium. Okay. So how, how long um, do they last? But they some of them, they have them. some hybrids that can, you know, in these kind of conditions, they don't need many bugs, and they do. They catch insects just like even in my growth chambers. I sometimes see really tiny, tiny insects inside it, like um, like springtails. You know, things that live in soil. They'll catch those, um, but they don't really need. They won't die. Yeah, they'll be fine for a while. It'll take a while before they're nutrient stressed. Yeah, they do. These ones haven't flowered, um, but these ones usually flower every year. And um, and I have another species that produced flowers in the growth chamber, but it's kind of rare. Yeah, this so they have like a little. There'll be a little flower that that kind of grows out of the middle, and then it's like just one flower for each rosette. Yeah. And then these will have one will sort of grow off like these, like these leaves are growing off. One will turn into a flower one, and it will grow long, and then produce all these little flowers off of it. Yeah. I see these in the wild. What's a good place to look, or how to find them? These ones you can see out at um, Pankapoag Bog in the Blue Hills, and if you go on the boardwalk there, oh, you can go see them. Two. These two, okay. mm -hmm. and these are um, sundews, which are also, I think. These are native ones that you find in bogs too. You can actually see. Look, there's even another sundew. Do you see? That's a different species. So some sundews are more like curly, like round-leaved, and some are more long. I think it's really funny that I got three different carnivorous plants in one. <laughs> oh, there's another one too. Like two of these little guys. Yeah. So you can see those. These ones um, you'll probably only see in Southeast Asia, unless they're in. I mean. A lot of um, botanical gardens have them in their greenhouses. I think there are some in. You don't study fluid of your beast. I do. I study. I study the fluid. I'm. Uh, I'll talk about it more later. But I'm comparing organisms living inside the different convergent. I mean, systems. they're not in their original environment. But no, but I do also um, study them. Presumably, it's different inside here than yeah. you go in the forest. Yeah. Yeah. So these are not ones that I would use for my survey. These are for experiments. So this is like if I want to grow something in a growth chamber and like feed it something and see what happens. That's what these are for. Yeah. And I'll talk about an experiment where I use these in the next section. These things ever have. Yeah, so all... some of them are more green. These are particularly red ones. Yeah. Um, often like in the bogs, green, yeah. they vary between how green and how red they are, and it sometimes depends on how much sun they get. And it's also, so it's genetic, but it's also can move. Um, so these ones, I think, are genetic variants that are just particularly purple. Hmm. But um, in the bog out at Harvard Forest, where I, I have a bog of these. Often they're green, especially if they're in areas that are like growing next to another plant, so they might be a little bit shaded. Yeah. Then they're extra green. It's already so they're photosynthesizing. They still photosynthesize. Yeah, like these green bits can photosynthesize. And they need photosynthesis. They still they need. Yeah, they still need photosynthesis. You can get started so, if uh, okay. you're ready. Yeah. So part of the plant is photosynthesized. Yeah, these parts are. And the and the other part is like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's a good question. <laughs> ask it. Ask it at the next question. <laughs> Everyone back? All right. We'll move on to the next section. So, hopefully, all of you had some snacks, and you're doing your own digesting now, just like these plants, and you're ready to hear more about carnivorous plants. 
I'm going to be talking about some of the research I've done looking into convergence in pitcher plant communities. So remember convergent evolution and these wings in birds, bats, and insects that evolve separately. Now, this um, is a pattern that we see in nature, but we also see other patterns. And there's theory that I'm working on developing around this. So I want to talk also about convergent interactions. You can have a convergent feature of an organism, but can you also have convergent interactions between different species that you see appearing, sort of emerging, maybe in different parts of the world in sort of unrelated situations? So one example of this could be fungi and plants. And this is a type of, um, of system where you can have unrelated plants, like these are not very closely related, distantly related plants, um, and they associate with different kinds of fungi, but they have similar functions. So the fungi will help the plant to access nutrients, such as nitrogen, from the soil, and the plant, in exchange, will give carbon that they've photosynthesized, sugars, to the fungus. And it can be the only place that the fungus will get sugars from, is from its host plant. And uh, these sorts of relationships happen in really, really distantly related organisms. And in fact, we now know that these interactions have evolved separately at least 14 times. So they all have evolved separately, but they have these very similar structures that I've sort of zoomed in on here. And these are root tips and then the fungus growing around them. And if you see these structures, you can know, you can infer from that that the symbiosis is happening because it's happened, evolved separately at least 14 different times. So this is one example of convergent interactions. And I'm interested in looking at this theory in pitcher plants. So we have these Saracenia from, from um, North America, and we have these Nepenthes from Southeast Asia, and they all associate with different organisms. But a lot of these organisms seem to perhaps fulfill similar roles within the plant. And you do find certain things like they tend to associate with mosquito and midge larvae, um, certain types of flies. They have fungi and bacteria. They all eat ants as their sort of main prey, although they can digest many different kinds of insects. They all have these mites. But these plants are on opposite sides of the globe. So naturally, they would never come into contact with each other. And these species would never exist in both parts of the world simultaneously. And the organisms that associate with them would also never come into contact. So you're never going to see the same species in Southeast Asia in a pitcher plant as you would find in North America in a pitcher plant. I did an experiment to look at this with bac bacteria. So I collected bacteria from North American pitcher plants in their native bog habitats. And I also collected fluid from the bog around them. I did the same thing in Southeast Asia, collecting bacteria from the Southeast Asian pitcher plants and also from the sort of boggy soils around them. And what we see is that the bacterial communities from pitcher plants on opposite sides of the world are actually more similar to each other than to those communities from their surroundings. So even though a Saracenia pitcher plant may be growing in a bog, its community of bacteria inside of it is more close more closely related to the community of bacteria that's in the Southeast Asian one than it is to its own soil right around it. So this, to me, is signaling that pitcher plants are different from their surrounding environment, right? And they're able to select for certain types of, of microbial organisms that are interacting with them. And this could be because they have low pH or they have certain characteristics about these plants that causes the organisms associating with them to be similar. I did an experiment where I took the Southeast Asian pitcher plants, which are these with these broad leaves here, and I put them out in a bog at Harvard Forest, which is a research site that's just a couple hours west of here. And these plants I got from a nursery where they can sell you, you know, these Southeast Asian pitcher plants. And, um, and I put them out in the bogs before pitchers were opening, so while their pitchers were still closed and still sterile. And then after their pitchers opened, as they acquired rainwater, I sampled them over time. And I'm looking at, you know, do the organisms that live in this surrounding bog 
and normally associate with the Saracenia pitcher plant, will they also colonize these totally foreign hosts that are pitcher plants as well, but there's something they've never seen before, never experienced. Here's a zoom in of the experiment. And this is the Southeast Asian one. And you can see it's actually doing a great job of catching North American ants. So it doesn't have a problem catching ants, even though it's never encountered these particular ants before. This is um, the local species. And then this is a control. So I also put sterilized glass tubes out in these bogs so that they would collect rainwater. And I could see you know, what, was, what organisms were colonizing these glass tubes. And are they similar to the organisms that are colonizing the pitcher plants? This is some of my data. And this is looking at particularly mosquito larvae. And this mosquito is called Wyamia smithii. And it's a mosquito that only associates with Saracenia purpurea, which is the native pitcher plant. This on the y-axis is looking at the proportion of pitchers that have this mosquito present. And down here, you see different treatments. So this is a pitcher plant growing in the bog. And then these are ones in pots. So they're like these pots here that I brought out to the bog as a control because maybe the pots affect things. I wanted to also control for that because the Southeast Asian ones are all in pots. So now we can look at the Nepenthes. If we compare the Nepenthes with the Saracenia, these are two different species of the Southeast Asian pitcher plant. You can see that about 80 to 90% of these pitchers had this mosquito larvae in them. So um, it's a really high percentage. And about 40 to 50% of these Nepenthes had this mosquito larvae in them. And even though this is lower, I think this is really amazing because these mosquito larvae have never encountered these Southeast Asian pitcher plants before, but they're recognizing them as a host where they can grow and thrive. But the real, uh, the real important thing for this experiment is looking at the controls, right? So are there also 40 to 50% of the, the glass tubes that had mosquito larvae in them? And actually, there were zero mosquito larvae in any of my glass tubes. So it really shows that there's something about these foreign pitcher plants that are more similar to these local ones than, than to these glass tubes, than to these controls. So I still haven't analyzed the microbial data, um, but I have some clues. And this is an image. I got really lucky and snapped a picture of the mosquito. This is the mosquito that associates with this particular species of the pitcher plant. And when I surface sterilize, I have to kill some of these mosquitoes, but when I surface sterilize them and then plate them out and look at what grows, I find this yeast. And it's the same yeast that I find in these pitchers the highest abundant yeast, the one that I most commonly find in these pitchers. And so to me, this signals that you know, this yeast is probably going to be in these Southeast Asian pitchers as well, because we're seeing these mosquitoes. So that's a clue for what's to come, but stay tuned. <laughs> Conclusions from this experiment are that pitcher plant communities may be convergent, just like the pitchers. And this may extend to other systems where similar pressures cause similar organisms to interact with each other in similar ways. So I think that this research looking at pitcher plants and the communities that associate with them, some of those factors about who associates with what and how they establish these associations could also apply perhaps to human guts or to lakes or to other types of ecosystems where we see whole communities and networks of organisms interacting. The summary for this section is that convergent evolution can apply to species interactions. Bacterial communities in pitcher plants are more similar than the, than the communities from their surroundings, even though they're on opposite sides of the world. Local pitcher plant mosquitoes can colonize these foreign pitcher plants. And communities may follow this convergence of their hosts. The very last section that I'm going to talk about is carnivorous plants and global change. Um, global change is happening all around us, and a lot of it is human-mediated. So we know about global warming, and we know about climate change and how humans are contributing to that through emissions. But something that's not as well studied are other types of global change. And one of the types is reactive nitrogen being released into the air and soil. And this happens mainly through uh, 
fossil fuel combustion and through this massive large-scale agriculture where they're just dumping lots and lots of fertilizers onto these huge fields and then there's a runoff and it brings it to other parts of the world as well. You can also imagine that things like our septic systems, you know, runoff from a lot of different human associated systems can have higher nitrogen levels than you would normally find in, in soil. And nitrogen is definitely increasing. So this type of reactive nitrogen that's not commonly found in these soils, we can, we can measure it. We can see that it's increasing. If you look at 1860 and then the early 1990s, and then this is projected into 2050, you can see massive increases of nitrogen being deposited around the Earth. And this is happening in numbers that plants are not used to seeing. They're not used to interacting with these high numbers. And too much nitrogen is bad, especially for carnivorous plants. One experiment uh, looked at growing plants in high and low nitrogen conditions. This, this is the local species, which I have down here, Thuracinia purpurea. And this is sort of a normal picture. It's showing how it, how it forms this cup. And this is in the low nitrogen conditions. But then over here, in the high nitrogen um, conditions, the pitchers stop forming. So they actually don't, they don't even really have um, a tube anymore. And now they only have this extended keel, which is better for photosynthesis. So if they have all this nitrogen, maybe they don't need to be catching prey anymore. And they switch, they switch their development and they stop producing pitchers. But that means that the whole community that's associated with these plants is gone. They no longer have a habitat. And Carnivorous plants, in general, lose their advantage in their habitat. So once a habitat goes from being low nutrients, where they can, they can compete really well with other plants, because they're good at getting these nutrients through eating insects, now if their habitat becomes the higher nutrient habitat, they're not going to be able to compete as well with other plants that are better at photosynthesizing than carnivorous plants are. The other thing that's happening is habitat destruction. So this is a bog in a pine savanna along the Gulf Coast. This is in Apalachicola National Park in Florida. And you can see there's lots of pitcher plants thriving. And all of these, um, these sort of misty looking plants are sundews. So carnivorous plants love these types of bogs. And then these are carnivorous plants in Southeast Asia. This is a really amazing species of pitcher plant that can climb as a vine. And these types of habitats are super threatened. So bogs are being constantly drained uh, in order to build things and for agriculture. And the rainforests of Southeast Asia are being changed into oil palm plantations. And they're completely destroying whole swaths of these types of rainforests. So just as a closing thought, just think about the amazing diversity of these plants how much we can learn from them, how much we still don't know about these communities associated with them, and perhaps how these communities can teach us about ourselves and about other types of ecosystems. So I think conservation and our impact on the world is a really good thing to think about, um, especially so that we can have these plants for the next generation. And they're all threatened, so they're all listed as endangered, at least the pitcher plants are. All right, on that note, I want to thank Thank all of you for being a wonderful audience. And I can take more questions. And thanks to our sponsors. People have more questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
So the question is, um, could those enzymes that are in pitcher plants be used potentially in other organisms? Um, can they be dried out and still used in other ways? Um, I am not a chemist, so I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, in general, a lot of times these enzymes could probably be used by other organisms because they break down things like proteins and carbohydrates. Um, but I don't know if anybody's looking into that. There are definitely people that study these enzymes, but I think they study them more because they're interested in, in this chemical biology and how these different enzymes can evolve multiple times. But um, I don't know of anybody looking at it for other organisms and their uses. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> bacteria might be better for that than pitcher plant enzymes, because bacteria actually are really good at, at um, doing a lot of types of metabolism. I mean, their metabolism is so much more diverse than most bacteria other organisms. Yeah, yeah, bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. OK, I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the question was, um, I didn't put this in a very phylogenetic context, this symbiosis and convergence. And how would you do that? How would you go about doing that? That's actually what I want to do for the end of my dissertation, is think about it in a phylogenetic context. So for people that don't know what that means, that's evolutionary trees, where you're actually looking at DNA and the relatedness between different organisms. And um, one way that you would do that, so there's a lot of tests for convergence, and um, there being, there's new tests actually being developed every year. There's a paper that just came out a few months ago. And one of the things you can do is you can look at how things are related to each other, and then you can see, you know, are they distantly related to each other, but do they have similar functions? And you can test that across many, many different iterations. So you can run these things called null models, where you basically shuffle the organisms that are involved, and you see this pattern that I see in my system, is it also found just by random chance by shuffling things around? And that's one way to look at it. So I'm hoping that I can look at it using these null models and using these new methods that are being developed, statistical methods, to look at relationships and convergence in a phylogenetic way. Yeah, so there's certain things. Like one thing might be the ability to change nitrogen from a form that plants cannot use into a form that plants can use. That's one example. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, when the, you did the test uh, about um, high nitrogen versus low nitrogen environment, was that mainly in the soil or air or both? So that wasn't my experiment, but that was done by a scientist out at Harvard Forest, and he's on my committee, so <laughs> I've talked with him about it. Um, that was in the soil. So that was actually looking at soil. He's also tested um, nitrogen from the air that might come down in like acid rain type situations. So he's, he's tested if you add the type of nitrogen that could be coming out of the atmosphere into pitcher plants, can they use it? And he's shown that they can. So they can use this reactive nitrogen that's coming out of the atmosphere, and it probably would change. It might take a while before it changes their growth patterns, but it probably would. Yeah. yeah. I think that was actually outside. So I think that was out in a bog environment out at this research station at Harvard Forest, yeah. As far as I know, um, there's a chance it could have been done in pots, but I think it was out, I think they made plots and planted them in these plots, yeah. Oh, the question was, 
were they doing it in pots or outside? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they don't yet. <laughs> I I think I might not go that direction, but I would definitely collaborate with someone who wants to do it. Yeah, it would be really interesting to look at their genome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's, oh, another one. Yeah, so some organisms you do find in other types of environments, but a lot of these larvae are only found in pitcher plants. So we think that they just manage to survive by, you know, laying their eggs and then hatching and living in these pitcher plants and moving to a new pitcher plant when that life cycle is continuing. Um, the Wyomia smithii, the mosquito that we find in the local ones, it doesn't bite humans, which makes it fun to work with. You know, I don't have to worry about mosquito bites. Um, we don't actually know what the adults feed on or if the adults feed at all. And the larvae can overwinter, they can, they can survive throughout the winter frozen in a block of ice inside the pitcher. So I've heard some other scientists say you can go and you can collect these blocks of ice out of these pitcher plants from under the snow and you can bring them back to the lab and thaw it and the larvae are fine, they swim around. So they must be good at, at handling really tough conditions, right? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take all these things off. Don't forget your survey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have to collect them. Uh, <laughs>